you and Eileen, and I want to thank the JCC for hosting us tonight. And I want to thank everybody that's dialed in. Although we can't see you, we are happy that you're here. And on behalf of the Institute for Nonviolent Chicago, welcome. And we look forward to bringing you into our work tonight. So I want to start by saying I think the high holidays are actually the perfect time to have this program and explore this work. Um, and it's not only because we as Jews believe in tikkun olam, but it's also that we share our own history that has seen its own share of violence and that we believe that um, answers are really found in taking care of others in this world. And we all believe in um, heeding the lessons that call for a time of action. And we are very much in a time of action that's needed right now. So I think many of you know that Jews played a very strong role in the civil rights movement in the United States. And we are entering another period of time where that action is needed once again. So tonight, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna guide a discussion with Tenny, who is our visionary founder and CEO of the Institute and Chris, who's our amazing head of programs. And we will kind of go through some of what we're thinking and doing. And then we really want to invite your questions in at the end. So uh, as Hillary said, please put all your questions in the chat box and we'll get to those. So just a little bit about my background with the Institute. I joined uh, the board 18 months ago and stepped up as the board chair in the fall. And I have to say that you know, what drew me to the work of the Institute was my own very personal concern with the escalating violence in our city. And this is something that, um, this is a mission that calls me more than, than so many other very worthy missions that, that we can work on, because I believe it's actually coming from a cycle of desperation and it really is, to my mind, the tip of the spear of the inequity that we see in our we see in our society. I also happen to believe it is the most important issue that's going on in the city of Chicago right now. And until we address it, it's very difficult for anything else in the city to flourish and and take hold. So it's something that's called me very personally. I knew about the institute's work back when I was the head of United Way. We funded the Institute for Nonviolent Chicago, and we did that through the JUF, actually. So I knew of the great work, and it was something that, that called me. But it really wasn't until after I left the United Way that I had a chance to sit down with Tenny and learn much more about it and really get involved. And what drew me in was, um, and I hope you'll feel and experience this this evening, the very thoughtful approaches that the Institute is using um, in this incredible work and the commitment to quality, principles, ethics, and the way the work is done. And I think the other thing that, that really hit me was, um, and, and hopefully you'll hear this as a pervasive theme in our work, everything is really a, 100% about the mission to end the cycle of violence and the work that we do through partners for it. And the organizational agenda is very much checked to the side. And so in my experience with um, in the nonprofit sector and working with United Way, I've worked with a lot of different organizations, but these things um, struck me as extremely rare. And this is a very special organization. Um, the other thing I think that's worth mentioning up front is that we're actually at a very special moment right now with the Institute for Nonviolence, and you'll hear more about this from Tenny and Chris, but we're on an important trajectory. Since the Institute started here in 2016, we've actually grown fourfold in terms of the size of the staff, in terms of the budget, and we're, we're really doing some very interesting things right now in terms of how we're honing our strategy, getting our word out, kind of like what we're doing tonight. And of course, responding to everything that's gone on um, in the city of Chicago over the past few months. So it's, it's a very interesting time. Um, you know, it's been a time where our board has had to roll up our sleeves and really get involved in supporting the team. That has given me a very um, personal feeling of great purpose through this work and in the beauty of, of having a chance to work alongside of this incredible team. And I hope that, um, 
this evening and what you learn tonight will be that very personal and meaningful call for you too. So with that, what I'm going to do is actually quickly give you a little more background on Tenny and Chris and then get started in, in talking to them. So um, I think you should know that Tenny is actually an award-winning figure in the field of nonviolence, both nationally and internationally. He started his work uh, on the streets of Boston while he was doing his degrees at Tufts and Harvard. And at that time, he developed street outreach approaches and methodologies that have, have really come um, to be seen as best best in class, best practice across the country and the world. In 2016, he and the Institute were brought here to Chicago through grants that were provided by very significant foundations to help the city of Chicago develop these best in class approaches to street outreach. And also to uh, enhance the building of a coordinated architecture to end the cycle of violence in the city. He came from Providence, Rhode Island, where he founded the Institute for Nonviolence in Providence. And in Providence, the Institute was successful in drastically reducing gang violence, negotiating ceasefires between the gangs, and working in lockstep with the police to keep the peace. Um, I think of interest to this crowd here, he's a veteran of the IDF. He's an amazing thinker, doer, and mensch. Chris oversees our programs and all of our policy work. And as you could see from the videos that were provided as part of this program, he's an incredibly thoughtful leader and persuasive advocate. He brings extensive background from prior experiences as a community organizer and program manager for Ceasefire with the ONE Northside organization. He also served as the associate director of organizing for the Community Renewal Society. Chris's experience, talent, and wisdom make him a piercing champion and mentor for this work in our city. So I feel privileged to work with these two extraordinary people every day, and it's always a treat to talk to them. So let's get started. So Tenny, I'm going to start with you, and can you briefly share how you came to this work and give us a picture of what's happening with violence in the city of Chicago? Yeah. Hi, Wendy. Well, you see how she emphasized briefly, because I do have Fidel Castro's tendency of uh, speaking uh, for very long. Um, the work for me, as I think it came probably through on many levels, the Holocaust. Uh, I lost uh, a lot of my family members in the former Yugoslavia. And I grew up quite enraged in Israel, being in Israel at the idea that we were abandoned in a civilization we lived in. Uh, and my family was betrayed personally, just like other people did. And uh, never having grandparents, etc. But as I came more to terms and growing up in Israel as a typical Israeli kid, I also started to think about the idea of the bystander. Uh, and and that's it. It was sort of percolating in my head. I came to America to study, um, and my parents warned me, don't get involved in any American issues. Study and go back to Israel. You are, son. But in 89, the Charles Stewart case happened, and uh, that was a terrible case. He shot his pregnant wife, and he called on a cell phone, 911, and said, a black man just shot my wife. It was not far from my school. It was near Bridgham and Women uh, at Harvard Hospital. And um, that created a real, sort of like the, what we hear now in April, all these gang members and all those things, CNN was there, etc. cetera. It got me involved with a small Pentecostal church, an African-American church, and uh, I never left, I guess. I got close to some of the so-called drug dealers and I started teaching photography and they sucked me into going to court with them and advocating and they expected to be abandoned. At the end of the summer, when we finished project, they said, so when are you leaving? I said, what do you mean when am I leaving? I live in the neighborhood. And I started to realize that sense uh, of, I cannot be a bystander uh, as a human being. I realized at that time there were people who took life and risk and hid Jews in Europe, and they took real risks to their own families. 
And I started to realize that in America, we're facing with similar situations. And if we easily can say, this is not our problem, uh, other people live in conditions that I think dehumanize me as a human being. And I never left. I was recruited then to Rhode Island to start the Institute for Nonviolence. We had some phenomenal successes. By the way, Boston, some people call it the Boston miracle. Uh, for 27 months, we had no juvenile killed. This was after the crack epidemic, which is still the longest record in the country. And in Providence in 2016, when I was already in Chicago for the first time, there was not even one gang homicide. So I was recruited to Chicago to come and help build something different here. And it's been quite a journey. I knew about Chris, I heard about him. We connected, a few of us connected and we built it. And I think I'll stay on brief and I think you're gonna ask Chris about the next steps. Yeah. Um, so Chris, I'd like to ask you what drew you to INVC's work. And I think, um, you know, maybe you can kind of give a, you know, a thumbnail of what's going on in the city right now as well. All right, for sure, thank you. So when Tinny came into um, Chicago, it was around November in 2015 for me, and I was at the, uh, the uh, Community Renewal Society working on issues, policy issues and advocacy uh, components that would address mass incarceration and gun violence. Uh, so prior to that, I had, been, had the privilege of working with Cure Violence Ceasefire, and I just understood like there were two worlds apart, right? So working in direct service, being able to fix the right now for people, which was an incredibly important because while people are going through trauma and their events, they need to know that someone is there for them. So that's what Cure Violence did for us. Um, but then I had the privilege of also doing organizing, which worked on the long-term solutions for people, uh, eliminating lifetime barriers for employment, uh, making sure that people had equal opportunities when being you know, hired or looking for a job opportunity. Um, so when I spoke to Tenny, one of the biggest parts for me coming from community organizing was we need to figure out how to create an organization that affects, effectively addresses the right now circumstances, meaning violence, but also works towards um, making sure that people and policies are changed so that the circumstances are different and that we don't just need more programming. And that would be in the form of community organizing and, you know, any uh, love the idea, um, you know, and, and decided that, you know, let's make that part of the organization that we want to create. And that was, that was for me everything. Because in Chicago, in places like Chicago, there aren't many organizations that work on direct service and long-term policy changes. Um, and, and, you know, to combine those two, to be thoughtful about that, I think that's the real service that community need, right? Um, you know, when we're, it's the old adage when, you know, I can, show you how to fish or I can give you the fish, right? And so policy work kind of shows people how to, and policy to, to fix the, the under root cause of why they're in the circumstance in the first place. In Chicago now, I think a lot of that is the reality. And so since 2020 March, the, the work that we do, reaching out to young men and women in the communities of Austin, West Garfield Park and back of the yards means that we're addressing the conflicts, the shootings and the homicides like we were, working with those who are at risk of either shooting someone or being shot. In addition now, because of COVID, which has impacted us just like it has impacted everyone else in the world, we've been handing out more than 3,000 meals a week, uh, working with our partners, right? There's, there's, and unfortunately, because of the murders of George Floyd uh, and others, we've had to deal with rioting and looting and so much of the, the street outreach component has transformed to so much more. Um, if you would, quasi public health professionals now giving COVID uh, education and, and PPEs out to those uh, in the community who are in need. And then so a lot of ways we're thinking, right, how do we address the, again, the right now, but in circumstances that extend far beyond just gun and gang violence, it is really just addressing the harm, the generational harm for generations communities like the one we work in or something. Yeah. Yeah, I like uh, you talked about the, the long-term structural change that can happen from the policy work. So, you know, in this, in this um, odyssey, let's say, of the miracle in Boston, the work that you started doing in Boston, Tenney, 
the time in Providence, the recruitment here to the city of Chicago that the foundations did by putting up funding to bring the institute here. Um, tell me just a little bit about what were they focused on that they wanted to bring through the institute into the mix in Chicago, you know, and what does that history since 2016 look like? And, you know, by now you all may know on the call that the Institute is working very specifically in three neighborhoods, Austin, Chris just mentioned it, Austin, West Garfield Park, and back of the yards. And so Tenny, you know, why the Institute, why do they need to come to Chicago? What's the startup history and why those three neighborhoods? So if you look at the trajectory in the late 80s and early 90s, a lot of American cities, most American cities were on fire. Violence was very high. Chicago had more than 900 homicides. New York had more than 2,000. Um, Los Angeles had a huge amount. Boston, all those cities, everyone was not doing well. Um, and then fast forward 20 years, actually 30 years, many, many cities figured out how to reduce violence. It's still far from where we want it to be, uh, but it is, they really reduced violence significantly from the late 80s and early 90s. Chicago remained, uh, by and large, an outlier in those levels. Definitely can compare it to uh, New York and Los Angeles. And the question is why? And it's not just a theoretical question. Uh, it is a question that relates to mothers and families who lose their loved ones. So it's an important question. Our field of violence reduction, it's a pretty small field. We mostly know each other on all coasts and in the middle and even in other countries. And, um, and the, very often when you look at the problem, trying to diagnose it, you know that it's not that the gang members are different. It's not the individuals, the human beings on the streets who are acting to survive. As Arnie Duncan said, young people are going to have to feed themselves and pay the rent. The question is, are they going to do it in the legal economy or illegal economy? So often it is at the level of the elites where failures happen. And we know the history of the Chicago police. Well, it was similar to Boston and Providence and New York and Los Angeles. Many of those cities went under consent decrees and started to fix themselves. Um, that did not go well here in Chicago. Some of the politics here, the segregation quite acutely, uh, the poverty levels and unemployment. Um, in Boston, for me, something very noticeable. In 89, 90, we had 11,000 uh, summer jobs because there were so many empty lots from people who left the cities in uh, white flight. You go now to Boston, there's almost no empty lots. You go to Englewood, to back of the yard, to the west side of Chicago, and it's still the same empty lots as when Martin Luther King, the riots when he was killed. That is a failure of policy and imagination and investment, right? This, you cannot blame the people on those corners. It is how did we invest? How did we manage that? So I was brought in because I'm a product. I didn't invent all of that. I just want to kind of really tone down a little bit, I was a participant in many of those things. How you bring things together, it is not just about great outreach, which is important. It is, what's the role of law enforcement? Do we want to make the government legitimate again? Which we do. Uh, we do not want to be superheroes. We want other parts to help fix themselves. So we're not just focused on those involved in the violence. How do we work with the attorney general and the district attorneys, etc on treating victims differently? How do we approach hospitals? How do we communicate? There's so many pieces. And we really built a new architecture in Chicago that has Chicago cred, which Arnie leads, and he, he gives amazing talks and they have great success. At Ready Chicago, which is part of Heartland, and we are participating, which looks at employment and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, to those most traumatized and most involved in violence in three neighborhoods. And then you have Communities Partnering for Peace, which is a partnership that we helped build, which is now 15 partners in 21 neighborhoods where you have about 80% of the homicide. So the results were from 16, 2016, in 17, 18, and 19 in Austin, which is the neighborhood we started with on the west side. It's the most violent neighborhood in the city. It's the largest neighborhood in the city has the most amount of people coming back from jail in the city. 
we had close to 50% reductions in shootings. Again, I want to temper down the salesmanship. Some of it, we had great commanders that we've partnered with and some other partners, great investments. But also, um, it was at the heels of 2016 how badly it was doing. But those were impressive numbers. We led for three years the reductions in the city. 2020, and I'm sure we'll get to it later, is a different story, and we will address that for you as well. Okay, I think that, that's great background. Um, so Chris, let me turn to you as our head of programs. You know, I think it could be really helpful if you kind of lay out what exactly we're doing in the three neighborhoods. Um, you know, I think and street outreach isn't necessarily extremely clear to a lot of people who haven't worked with it, you know, for a long time. So maybe, you know, just explain a little bit about what's involved and what we're doing in the three neighborhoods. Yeah. So there's many components to the design that we created in 2016. So historically, street outreach has always been one component, and that being an outreach worker goes into the community. Typically, an outreach worker is a person with lived experience, meaning they're formerly incarcerated, oftentimes formerly uh, involved in gang. Um, and then once in a while, you find someone who doesn't fit any of that. They're just very good uh, people. people. So you find an outreach worker in the past and you put them back into a community in which they have relationships. The objective is to establish relationships, connect with those who are drawn in the cycles of violence, and then move them towards prosperity. That's the model. What we wanted to do is what we understood in 2016 was that that's too much uh, for one individual. We wanted one individual to take their profession, hone their skills, and narrow it down into um, you know, just a, an asset that we can give participants we work with. So we created multiple components to the organization. The first part, if you think about street outreach, is finding somebody who has a lived experience, who's from the community of Austin, who knows people on those hot spots, those hot blocks where shootings and violence is taking place. Insert them back into the community after you've vetted them. So we do a background check, there's drug screening, we give them on extensive training around conflict mediation, nonviolence, uh, uh, trauma-informed care practices, and then we put them into the community uh, with the expectation that they'll develop a relationship with those who are drivers of violence and or likely to be shot. Once that establishment is made, they then transfer that over to a case manager. So oftentimes in our field and in our organization, the case managers often have those lived experiences. And that's important because understanding where our participants are coming from um, is, is, is critical. And sometimes having those lived experiences kind of gives you that bird's eye view. From there, we also have a, a, a program in our organization called Victim Service, which we're extremely proud of. It's, a, it's one of the parts that was always missing in Chicago and that Tinny brought from Providence, Rhode Island. This being, we work with families of those who've lost loved ones. And it's an incredibly hard job to do. It is not a job many people can do. Um, and so we're very thoughtful in how we hire people on uh, the training they get and the support they get and they need in order to serve the family best. We'll help those families with victim compensation, uh, insurance, buying food for their home, just caring, mental health support connection. And, and we also service those who have been shot or wounded because of gun violence, uh, because hurt people hurt people. And our strategy, because it's a violence prevention strategy, is making sure that those folks don't feel they need to take law into their own hands. In fact, we then create a, a network of like-minded staff who then put our arms around that individual, um, talking them off the cliff for violence. Uh, we have nonviolence training, which is the Kingian principles uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King created for us through the steps and the principles and the philosophy overall. We train all our staff, we train community members, and it's free to other organizations who work within our areas who are gonna give services to community members. And lastly, like I spoke of earlier, we have a community organizing component. And you know, the idea here is 99% of the people in Austin want the violence to stop in Austin. They just don't know how to do it on an individual level. So the Institute for Nonviolence would like to be the vehicle in which they get in so that they can be part of the solution. Um, and you know, people feel good about that. They just want an opportunity to be involved in something meaningful. Uh, we've been able to take this and you know, expand uh, into those expansions that Tenny spoke about, Community Partner for Peace, where we have 14 other partners across the city of Chicago who we're connected with uh, and always sharing best practices with. 
it's a little unique situation that has ever existed for us uh, and we're loving it. Okay, that was a great, I think that was a great layout of all the different levels that um, the Institute is working with people and families, the neighborhood community, um, and then other organizations across the city, not, not just in the three neighborhoods that, that we talked about that we are so extensively involved in on the ground, but also with partners in the architecture across many other neighborhoods that are experiencing violence in the city. You know, we, um, I think in some ways are very uniquely involved in working with the police and I think everyone would say that this is a critical relationship and a lot of the answers now need to be found in understanding how community organizations can work with the police. And I think the Institute um, has some amazing experience and things going on that date back from Providence, as I said in the beginning. So Chris, I'm gonna start with you, but really I'd like both of you to talk a little bit about the different ways that we work with the police and how we see the most effective change going on there as well. Yeah, when Tinny, so Tinny also came with this idea along with victim service and, you know, initially when it was brought to the staff, it had not been, um, you know, something that had happened prior to in street outreach when it concerned Chicago and in a lot of places. Uh, what makes a lot of people really good for staff members at an organization like the Institute is because of those lived experiences. But because of those lived experiences, they often clashed in the past with law enforcement. So it was always a contentious relationship initially. When Tinny's vision was kind of like, you know what? That is a conflict as well. Like, we're professional mediators. We're, we, we resolve conflicts and address those. And it's oftentimes when we don't like to resolve the conflicts in our own backyard. And so to have a conflict, an unresolved conflict, even with law enforcement, it is not in the spirit of nonviolence. You know, principle two of nonviolence is building the beloved community. And so in order for us to get to, to fulfill and live out you know, our obligations and our foundation, we had to live by, you know, pre practice what we preach. So, you know, Tenny was very instrumental in that, you know, and, and as it goes forward, we're four years into this, um, a partnership or some working understanding with law enforcement. Uh, we've trained law enforcement since then. We have a, a basic understanding with law enforcement that we won't throw them under the bus if we see anything that we don't feel good about and vice versa, but that we would rather talk about it. And in the four years, we've had many conversations, not always easy conversations with law enforcement we're working with, uh, resolving conflicts that have happened between say outreach workers and, and, and patrol officers. Uh, but we've always come to an understanding and resolved those conflicts using nonviolence. So as you'll see, nonviolence plays a huge part in how the, we work. Uh, we believe that if anyone is not gonna be a part of the beloved community, it's all simply because they exclude themselves. Uh, you know, and, you know, because we happen to have phenomenal leadership in the districts in which we work, uh, we've been blessed to run across commanders who have moved on to become deputy commanders who were visionaries themselves, who were, who saw the value in creating a, a community policing model that actually thought very much about nonviolence in the way that we thought about them, that it was too long, conflict had been going on too long, and that fences needed to be mended. Um, so that's my portion of that. Tenny? Yes, I mean, I think you covered it really well. You know, part of the goal of the Institute, if we want to reduce violence, is we got to equalize how people consume our government services. And the police is the most obvious uh, government, most immediate government service people see, especially in neighborhoods that are distressed. And the tension is obvious to those of us who are in the field. I think it's come now more to light with phone cameras and others around the country, uh, it's a very contentious relationship. Uh, there's a great argument by a writer in Los Angeles, Jill Leovi, who wrote a book called Ghetto Side, that really what causes high levels of violence is mistrust of the police. So we basically her argument is, and we relate to that, that homicide is an alternative justice. I'm getting my justice because I don't trust my government to get me my justice. It's more complicated than that, but it is one of the contributing factors. In fact, Chicago lags behind Los Angeles and New York also in clearance rates of homicides and shootings. Not surprising. They were in the same bad shape. No one trusted them. They worked very hard to change that. We see ourselves as a, as a tool to help change that because we speak the truth to the police, but we do that as professionals who care about them. 
we know officers, we know commanders, we know their dedications, uh, but we also, they won't tell us it's only a few bad apples. They're, they know that we're serious about them changing the culture and they gotta change the culture. Uh, same as we're trying to change the culture of violence among young people. It is really on all of us. Violence in the nonviolence movement is also could be by funding and by investments by city. If we look for justice, it's in all those segments. So we don't separate one or the other. But the most important factor that can affect our young people beside an opponent is law enforcement. You know, a wrongful address, uh, arrest or an aggressive arrest or a sentence that it can change completely a family, a life's trajectory. So we take those relationships extremely serious. We invest time in them. I don't know if we were really clear. We invested in, we respond 24 hours a day in the three neighborhoods. We build a system. We get notified immediately by law enforcement and by hospitals and by the community of every shooting. And we have outreach and victim services respond. So guess what happened there? Who is at the scene at two in the morning? It's only the police and our outreach workers. So here we gotta have an agreement how we negotiate the territory, right? We do not cross yellow tapes. This is their territory. We do not intervene in investigations, but we try and support the people who are watching it, who are traumatized, maybe family members. We humanize the scene. This is not just now we're investigating, the police is investigating what happened. There's also something that really now hurts a family. How is that right at that moment? How is it addressed? And we do have officers and many young officers come to the yellow tape and say, good job guys, keep doing it. They start being believing in that soft approach. Uh, and you, as you can imagine, as a Serbian Israeli, I did not grow up with a lot of soft approaches, but I also saw the limit of force and the limit of power and how much you can achieve and should achieve by being empathetic to another human being. And that is sort of what we're bringing and very every day we try and model our behaviors, both to young people who are involved in violence, to police officers, to government officials, to anyone, to our partners. How do we interact with each other is what's gonna change this city at the end of the day. And I'm speaking not sort of as a theoretician, I've been down to a few cities where this is work, where in Providence, the chief of police now is on the board of the Institute in Providence. It did not start like that. It started with the whole command staff in Providence getting fired. That's how it started. Thank you. I, want, I actually want to turn to, and we've gotten a couple of questions in the, in the question box about this, to, to the results and what we know is working. So, Tenny, I want you to talk a little bit about, you mentioned, kind of you touched on briefly, um, and I think it would be good to share some of the results about the reduction in the homicide rates that we saw from 2016 to 2019 and, and what that shows about what we know is working. What we know is working in terms of all the different programs that Chris talked about, what we know is working with the police. Um, so if you could just share a little bit about that. So, so I don't like to talk about programs, right? It's one approach, you have different tools, right? And that is, the people who get, so it's usually in every American city, 0.3% of the population drives 70% of the violence. So if you're a business person, that is your market. Our market are those involved in certain corners, hot spots, who either get shot or get arrested with guns. So we zoom in, we know our people, our staff comes from many of those groups. And we become their valet services. We're in their minds, we're in their heads, and we also offer them jobs. And when we can through ready cognitive behavioral therapy, we really pay attention to them. Now you can say justice, not justice, you know, they should be punished because they made their own choices. We can argue about that. I look at it as the person who is desperate now is more likely to produce for me at 11 o'clock tonight a victim for another family. So we almost postpone judgment. If these are the people involved in the cycle of violence, we don't analyze their choices at the moment and the environments they're coming from and what they have an option or not. We try and connect to them and we have great relationship. Chris was involved in bringing nine groups in Austin to mediation and maybe Chris, you also want to talk about back of the yard about some of the historic stuff that's been happening there. Yeah, I think 
a lot of that good work goes on. Um, you know, there was racial tensions immediately after George Floyd was murdered here in Chicago um, between the Latino organizations, uh, street gangs and African American gangs. We helped broker peace among that. I think there's always a lot of opportunities, but it doesn't happen overnight, I think, is one of the larger frameworks for that, right? So even you know, we would want the the moment, the day we started June 6, 2016, by June 7th, we wanted it all to be in, to be over. But it did take us almost three years to uh, to achieve a 50% reduction with you know, our partners in Austin. Um, you know, so like this stuff doesn't happen overnight. It's what we call relentless engagement and continued care. I want to jump in just so I was, I'm paying attention to the questions. People ask about the other neighborhoods. We're talking about Austin, and then we will talk about 2020 as well. So in back of the yard, Chris really led that effort. Um, we brought two Latino groups that were, you know, others will call them gangs, that were in a conflict of a few decades. And again, where we connected in our brains is we went to a memorial in a kitchen of a basement of an elementary school to a member of that gang and we saw just the mothers, the sisters and the young people. And I read a lot about them in newspapers and you know, long, they were using shotguns and really heavy riflery. They were involved in shooting an ATF agent. They were involved in, um, in even a, a son of a deputy chief who was in an undercover unit was shot. So there was a serious conflict, but you got to also collect evidence with your own eyes. And when we were in that basement in a Benedictine service, memorial service, in a kitchen with very, very noisy uh, cooling systems, all I saw was really broken and, and exhausted people. And I asked the outreach workers, tell me, uh, this is what I see. And he said, yes, Tenny, they feel trapped. They don't know how to end this conflict. They lost a lot of their friends, they're exhausted. They cannot go and work anywhere. They cannot leave the neighborhood, they will be shot. Uh, and Chris and I talked about that and we started reaching to both sides. And no one asked them before, if you stay on your side and you stay on your side, can we get some ceasefire? They were just not approached in that way. And in their really human full way and thinking about their mothers and sisters, etc. And we tried it. and. Chris, do you want to take it from there? Because this was really your effort. I want. I don't want to take your thunder. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I appreciate that, but it's all right. We could share that. Um, so those two organizations have now gone almost three years without shooting at each other. Um, while there's there's some blips, there's always us bringing them back in. The, the lieutenant from the 9th District informed us that this high priority conflict between these two gangs has now been downgraded to minimal. Um, you know, which is an extraordinary, uh, you know, feat, you know, and it makes communities safer. And now soccer games are going on at the park in which they work, uh, you know, which they kind of hang out at. Um, children are playing now and, and, and people aren't dying. So at the end of the day, that's what we want. Wendy? Well, I think we haven't talked on West Garfield, if I may. So West Garfield is, is a difficult child of ours. We started that late. We started in 2017, I think in, the, in July or June. And we had, very, we had raging conflicts in West Garfield. And I think our team managed to get a hold on them. And really, it's a small neighborhood, but pick. If Austin is the most violent per capita, West Garfield is the most violent and one of the shortest life expectancy in the whole city of Chicago and the most poor. Um, so a team at, you know, some of 17 into 18 and 19 managed to resolve the internal conflicts in that neighborhood. But here is a different, every neighborhood is a bit different in character. Uh, West Garfield, according to Commander Spencer, he says is the biggest open drug market in the United States, his district. But in West Garfield, uh, what the city calls the Pulaski Corridor between the highway and Lake Street. Uh, I just left from there an hour and a half ago. We had a pop-up there on Wilcox and Pulaski. It is really addicts from even beyond the city come there. There's prostitution, there's addiction. 
And, and that, by the way, did not change with COVID. Of course, people do not get cured. There's really a need of, and the mayor is focused on it now, to start gathering some investments that are beyond outreach and violence, really investing in homelessness, in investing in drug rehabilitation, all those services. It, it feels those things did not, they existed in the early 90s in other cities, these open drug markets. With cell phone, there's no really need for them. This is one of the last places, and it's a testament for a very deep disinvestment. So what we have now in, in West Garfield, is we're dealing with a lot, particularly now with COVID, shutting a lot of things down and a lot of incomes. Since the addicts are there and selling of drugs to them goes on, people come to rob the dealers, or well, some of the young people we work with. So there's a lot of outside flowing into that open drug market. It's much different, difficult, more difficult to manage because we really work on relationships. And when you have people constantly transient in and out or just coming to try and rob someone from, coming from the outside, that makes it more difficult than different strategies. And for us, it is a challenge of problem solving. So it's not enough to just solve the conflicts within the neighborhoods. We're dealing with a lot of transients and we're putting our heads with some of the best people on that. And we will be very stubborn about that. Um, so this, I think we kind of gave you a bit of a taste of the three different neighborhoods we work in. I think that's yeah. good. Yeah. I think, um, there's, um, there's some kind of a theme coming through questions that I think is really interesting um, that, that would be interesting to hear you guys talk about. So questions about the partners that that we are partnered with, how we work with schools. I think it could be interesting for people to hear a little bit about how we're working with the city, uh, you know, the mayor's office in particular. And, you know, everybody knows, you know, we just talked about significant reductions in several of the neighborhoods, particularly in Austin, where we had the longest time to reduce that homicide rate. We all know that this is a very unusual year, a very difficult year, and violence has been increasing. I think it would be interesting to hear from both of you a little bit about why you think that is. So I think sort of two parts to this question, who we're working with as partners um, in different ways, you know, different kinds of organizations, and in particular, the mayor, and then um, what, what the factors that you both think are driving the increase of violence now. So maybe Tenny, you could talk a little bit about the, the mayor's office of gun violence prevention. Uh, I can speak a little bit about some of the driving factors potentially for why. Uh, I don't even know if I can say why wholeheartedly, but this idea of violence is not just going up in Chicago. And I don't want to make that out to be a scapegoat. It is, it is happening in astronomical numbers across every major city in the United States and across the world, uh, South America. Uh, there is a level of anxiety and hopelessness that I've never seen uh, people have before. I would say one of the magic pills for outreach is being able to connect to someone, find out what it is they need, and connect them to those resources. Now, the majority of people that we work with are quite a few of them, uh, have records that don't make them as appealing as someone who has just been laid off after 10 years at a job or five years at a job. Americans are losing jobs at an amazing rate right now. And you know those few jobs that are open now make it harder for us to connect the participants we work with. And they know that. Um, categorically, before COVID started, 80% of our participants were homeless. They were couch surfing, sleeping on buses and trains or at friends' homes. Uh, what does that do now for a family who can't really risk you sleeping on their couch because you can affect and maybe potentially get the whole family sick? Um, mental health illness, right? Trauma. You know, the majority of, of, of participants we work with have either been shot or all of them have lost close friends and or witnessed violence of hand, close, close to hand. So all of this goes untreated. Uh, but I'll say, uh, you know, a couple other factors that, that contribute as well. Um, Illicit drug use is skyrocketed, right? So the arrest of drugs, for instance. But not only that, prescription drug use uh, is at a level in which it's not been before, right? So people who have medical cards and insurance are, are turning to, to drugs to try to address the, the, the anxieties that COVID and everything related brings. Uh, domestic violence 
is off the scales right now, right? So we're working and talking to domestic violence organizations who have not seen as many cases, right? And so what I want to say is this larger thing is not only is it happening in, you know, African-American communities among young black men, but violence and its undertones and the components of violence, drug addiction, hopelessness, et cetera, all of that is through the roof, right? And so that makes it very hard. So now we're, while the, the mentorship, I don't want to take away the value of mentoring someone who's trapped in a cycle of violence, uh, but there is no, there's no follow through with resources now because everyone is bare on resources, right? And so while it doesn't explain, um, I think it does bring some context to why potentially violence. And lastly, the young people that we work with who are trapped in those cycles of violence, the reason they use violence is their form of expression. Now, whether we accept that or not, violence is a communication, right? When I'm upset, you violated me. How I show that to you, and show it to everyone else, how I express that is by prior using violence. And what we're trying to do is just show people how to communicate on different levels using nonviolence, how to, how to teach them actually how to talk, communicate with one another uh, so that they don't feel they need to get a gun and, and shoot someone in order to get their point across. So maybe, Tenny, you could talk a little bit about our city, a yeah. component of how we got to where we're at with uh, the relationship with the mayor's office. So I want to pause here and say that our hearts are very, very heavy, right? We we respond almost daily to shootings. And Chris was yesterday at a shooting scene and at the hospital. I was in back of the yard with a grandmother who was shot three weeks before through the shoulder, etc. So uh, I don't know, like we're going through the presentation, we're trying to be factual and give you some answers, but uh, you know, it takes motivation to get up and keep going. This is, this is a very unusual year. But I also know that we have a conviction and we have experience that what we build now, the architecture we're building now for Chicago and with the great partners, and I'll, I'll veer off to the city in a minute, uh, is going to change this city. And, you know, the former Charlie Beck who was the chief in L.A., and I, was, uh, I spent some time there with him. Uh, when he came here temporarily to Chicago, he said in Chicago, I mean, in Los Angeles, it took 15, 20 years, you know, New York, Boston, this is not a quick fix. Uh, but I will tell you that 2020, all our gains of the last three years are wiped out. That, that can be extremely discouraging. Uh, now, Wendy, Tenny, and Chris, we, People will not follow us and our team will not follow us if we just uh, tear our hair, hair out and feel, fall in despair. This is a tough year. This is like one of those battles where you get overwhelmed with three tsunamis of, of COVID, of police legitimacy being questioned. So police dropped their stops significantly when COVID came. Uh, understandably, their, their, their profession is very much touching people. Uh, they dropped it again after the George Floyd demonstrations. And the legitimacy is in question. The field is in question. Uh, most nonprofits went virtual. So there was suddenly us and the, out, and the police out there in the neighborhood. It was eerie. Uh, we distributed 3,000 boxes of food a week. There was hunger, hidden hunger. People losing their jobs left and right. School, the longest school vacation. It really is, feels like, I don't want to over-traumatize that, but the way I remember the October war in Israel in 70, uh, 73. Sunny things really dramatic. And no one is asking in Sarajevo when there's bombing, hey, why is the SAT scores down? Right? We're in a very different environment. But we do believe, hey, I will tell you, and you'll just have to believe me, if this architecture didn't exist, Chicago was so vulnerable, there would have been a major collapse here. And luckily we're still there, still connecting with young people. Even though they're at home, they don't have jobs, they're stuck, they're restless, we're still connecting, we're working with people and we're mediating a lot of situation, despite the numbers being so high. But uh, things have wiped out. The last three years, successes, numbers, in terms of saving lives, now we're back to uh, where we started and we're going to continue it again. Hopefully we do not get another COVID in the next 10 years so we can complete the transformation. Um, 
I think uh, the city hall question is a very important one. Uh, I'll use a, a Yiddish expression, fine schmeckers. A lot of us really want the perfect person to lead uh, the city, and if not, we're gonna sit and watch. I'm not a subscriber to, uh, to uh, sort of observatory democracy. We elected a mayor who, has, who is very intelligent, who cares about people, who really, really saw the South and the West Side and wanted to change the disinvestment of 40, 50 years. And I get some of those questions, is she up for it? Can she handle it? And we need to pause as human being. I'm a leader of a small organization and I know how hard it is. Do you want to be the mayor of the city of Chicago at this moment? She had a tough, tough task. Uh, almost a billion dollar deficit which she inherited. She did not imagine she will hit COVID and all of the police legitimacy and new civil rights movement. She's facing all of that. And just as a human being, I'm appealing to all of us. We need to have empathy. It's very easy now in our media to just sit in judgment of everyone. It is very, very hard to move and being in her position with them, her budget, etc. So she has hired some amazing people. I heard the other day the planner from Detroit who works for her now on investments. Nothing to do with my field, but everything to do. But she instituted and really built an office which is run by a very, very smart woman from Los Angeles, Susan Lee, of violence prevention. This city, believe it or not, I don't know how people expect it to reduce the violence here, never had a coordinated effort coming from City Hall to deal with violence. Who is responding? Victim services, outreach, police, how are we handling situation, hotspots, how we're preparing for weekends that are difficult. Coordinated efforts, sanitation is involved in that, parks and rec for the first time. We have coordinated meetings every other week on the south side, on the west side, by districts and by command. Uh, it's, there's a lot to build, but they brought some of the best practices from other places. And I think we all need to be involved. If the mayor fails, it's not just we elect another person. This is our city. Can we lose four years? And I would just say her job has become about 4,000 times harder with what happened this year in our country. So I, I'm going to um, get us a little wrapped up here. I, I want to um, end on just one quick question. I want to ask each of you um, what gives you hope at this point, and then I want to share a little information with people to make sure everybody knows how they can get more involved if they're interested, and then we'll turn it over to all of your questions um, for folks who are Zoomed in. So Tenny, let me start with you. What gives you the most hope right now? I'm like, I can't wait to, to get to be with the people I work with, right? I mean, you know, when we were deciding what to do with COVID, when we were like starting to shut our main office, we moved to a smaller one in, in West Garfield. We told people, you know, we should, you should, you, a lot of them have, if they've been in prison, et cetera, people have, not have the health, healthiest uh, health conditions, their precondition. I remember looking in one of our rooms at our staff, at some of our staff, and I was asking who from us is not going to be here when we come back, right? Who from us is going to die, quite honestly? Uh, and the team very quickly, different teams in different neighborhoods said, we're not going to work virtual. We sign up to maybe get shot. We're not going to be, we're not going to go back home. This is what we sign up for. These are our communities. We're going to be out there. And how they, and they, this is really, this was our, everything before was sort of boot camp. This was the war. And they came out in strong flying colors. They kept preaching peace. The violence was there. The hunger was there. We, yesterday, we distributed six pallets, massive pallets, a few hundreds of boxes to people with food. And their energy. I don't know how they do that. I'm a hard worker, but we wake up at all kinds of days and nights, Chris, seven days a week, and the dedication. And today we were in a pop-up in, uh, in Austin, and one of these wild-looking young people who was shot a few weeks ago came running and just gave me a high five. Hey, Tenny. Just loving that the outreach workers are there. We had a DJ. People respond to love. 
people are resilient in many ways. How do they have that hope? Uh, inspires me and I see it all the levels. I see the police deputy chiefs now that when we started, they were lieutenants who are now really reliant on those partnerships and the joy of doing the work together and seeing a different path that fills me with hope. Great. Great. Thank you. And for me, what brings me hope? Um, so I grew up in Cabrini Green. I have lived experiences very much like the young people we work with and the people I work with. Um, and I grew up in an environment where our schools were not funded properly. Um, and we're looking at, we're working in an Austin right now where teachers are still buying toilet paper and the basic school supplies. While in other parts of the city, um, pre-COVID, um, you know, have computer labs. And that's beautiful because that's what children should have, you know, third graders and fourth graders. The inequity, watching young men who, who will probably never realized that American dream they have trapped in their head. Uh, all of that was frustrating, right? And that was what James Baldwin talked about when he spoke about being mad African-American, a mad black man in America, to be able to watch your community, just every community that's ever even associated with me, uh, almost feel like it's going down the pits and that's hard to watch. Uh, with travesty comes opportunity. And with George Floyd, we have now corporations asking what they can do. We have people asking, how can they step up? You know, we want our schools to be funded the same way they're funded in Lincoln Park and Lakeview. And I don't think that's an unfair demand. Uh, we want people to have, you know, job opportunity. Uh, we want people to feel like if they work hard, um, they can get ahead. But that is not the American dream for so many Americans who look like myself and darker. Um, so what gives me hope, though? is that there are so many people like the people on this call today who are just really ready to step up, uh, be on the front lines um, and get involved, get their hands dirty, right? And getting involved and in making sure that this, um, the inequities uh, stop and that people are given a fair shake at life. And I'm holding on to that. You know, this moment, while it feels very dark and it is indeed dark, uh, gives me an opportunity to say like, there's too many good people who are who are righteously angry and rightfully so um, for this continue to happen. So I, you know, I'm looking forward to the change that is going to happen uh, for the remainder of 2020 and into 21. Uh, I know we know we all want to get past COVID um, so that we can really dig in, uh, but it has highlighted uh, some of the stuff that has just been trapped in my head and, and you know, the people who live in the communities like Austin, West Garfield Park and back of the yard. Okay, thank you both. Um, okay, so I, I actually want to kind of um, wrap this up here. We got a couple of um, questions about our funding, which I actually want to um, address. And I want to sort of segue into some of the questions were about how we're funded in general and also what we might need and what might be helpful, how the community might get involved. So I want to just sort of take that issue and it's just a great segue into how if you guys are interested to get more involved, you can. And I wanted to say that one of the things that makes me hopeful is that we've got a huge group of members here, several hundred folks who were interested enough to dial in and, and watch the videos and learn about the Institute and ask good questions and wanna get involved. And I go back to what I said at the beginning, I think that this is, um, this is not only what gives me hope, this is what's needed actually to address this problem. So the Institute's funding, we are funded in a variety of ways, mostly through grant funding, public grants at the city level, at the state level, um, and then a lot of private grants, mostly from foundations locally, very large, significant foundations locally, but also we just got our first national grant, as well as corporate gifts, and then individual givers, individuals that have foundations, individuals that have family foundations, individual givers, um, donors of all kinds. And so there's many, um, there's many ways to get involved with the Institute, of course. Um, giving a gift or supporting our funding is 
welcome and appreciated anything is helpful and anything um, that feels comfortable for you to give is always appreciated. We actually put our website, you can see it actually in the chat box here. You can just go to our site, which is nonviolentchicago.org and it's really easy to make a gift there if that's what you wanna do. Um, I think everything that we talked about tonight, you can tell we're at the crossroads of wanting to do a lot more. And so while Chris is right, we've had a lot of interest of significant foundations and funders come to us. Um, all the support is really helpful. I also want to say that a lot of people have been giving in kind gifts, and that's also really helpful, especially right now in COVID things like food and toiletries and diapers. And if you're interested to give in kind gifts or you're able to do that, um, Tara Dabney can help you to organize that. So her um, email is in the chat box too. You can just email Tara and, and she can help you um, figure out how to do that. Other ways to get involved. There's many ways to volunteer with us, even, even right now through COVID. So, the first thing I'll say is um, we are really in need of pro bono help. We have pro bono partners. We have pro bono partners on the legal side. We have pro bono partners on the professional side. If there are things that you can give of yourself and your talents and your expertise, there are things that we could use and that's a really, really wonderful way to get involved. In particular, we are looking for computer and IT training and skill building for our team and for the community. And um, if you have any kind of pro bono expertise, talent, professional services that you would like to contribute, email me. My email is in the chat box, um, w.dubo at, at, at att.net. Um, and we can sort of talk through what that is. That can be a great way to get involved. You can also help spread the word on all of this work. So now that you've got our videos and you attended this program, share it out with your folks. Come to our website, get involved in our events. We've got virtual events, we've got um, live events. There are things that you can get involved in. And you can also, you know, getting back to the public policy piece that Chris talked about earlier, you can use your voice for good structural change. If you felt moved by some of these things, or you continue to follow this work and you feel moved by it, you can contact your alderman, your village manager, your state rep, and let them know that you think that funding at a public level for these things is really important. And so you can see what we're trying to do here is not just not just look for financial support. Financial support is important, but look for engaged, activated citizens that help fight for this work and um, essentially bring about the change that we need for our community. So um, those are some of the ways that you can get involved. We look forward to your questions. I'm going to turn it back to um, Hillary and Eileen and see um, what questions you guys want to pop forward for us. Thanks, Hillary. I, um, I kind of feel like you guys answered everything that uh, we've gotten. I'm just scrolling through quickly to see if there's anything else, but I do honestly think that you have, uh, you've answered all the questions. You answered the question about specific resources to change the culture. I think you guys did a Fantastic job. I, I'm, I'm really so very impressed. Um, I told you before we came on that I've been watching all the social justice films that we'll be have coming up in the next few weeks. And um, it's all very inspiring. What, what's happened in the past, how, how our communities have worked together to, to, to make changes. And, and I hope that these conversations will continue to um, grow and and people will actually come out and and support um, the organizations that need help. Chris, Tenny, Wendy, any last thoughts from from you guys? I would like to say that you know I think in our fast society, etc., we we really lost sight of and it will sound hokey and I don't want to sound hokey. I'm a real realist. Um, but how much human connectivity is important. And maybe with COVID, actually, we are having a second reflection 
on that, but I want you to leave this talk uh, with a sense of hope and a sense of a can-do. For an immigrant like me, from the distance, America always seemed like a place where people can, it's a can-do society. Once you live here 30 years, you realize the gridlock in Washington and a lot of paralysis and frustration everywhere. But it is up to every generation to renew this. And, you know, the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are actually called in Hebrew. I sing in English too. The 10 terrible days. It is because reflection was taken very seriously. Today we're overwhelmed maybe with reflection and information and we, go, we don't go deep. Um, but I was a heavy kid and a funny kid, both. The Holocaust cast a very heavy shadow. The idea of losing just one war in Israel and being thrown to the sea was very real to me. The closest Palestinian city to Herzliya, where I grew up, is 13 kilometers. It's eight miles. It's very close. Uh, it wasn't theoretical that we could be annihilated. And at the same time, having power has a privilege. I, had, I, took, I, took, I spent time in the West Bank and in Gaza and in Lebanon. I started looking at, if you're not careful, you start using a lot of excuses with power, potentially, and you, you, gotta, you gotta always have a sense of everyone's humanity. And then in America, this is a 400 year saga. Uh, I will never compare a Holocaust. I will not compare the Jewish Holocaust, the Armenian Holocaust, which my parents as 14 made me read about. They wanted to make sure I'm not a chauvinist, just one of the things that only the Jews suffer. Uh, though, you know, I spent in 2011 a week in Auschwitz alone meditating, so I, I take my history seriously. But 400 years here of what African Americans have mainly suffered really, really, we need to change that. We're all tainted with that. And we can change it. I know that we can. The, see, the, the gross income of Chicago could be five times what it is if we addressed injustice and equality. Uh, and not just, we got to get reading beyond the left and right of newspapers or ads and just parties. And got to connect what our tradition is very strong about, the human connection, a lot of the mothers who are very important in the Bible of our nation were not Jewish, like my mother, who was not Jewish. And we need to really regroup on this city. And I'll close by saying that Jens Ludwig from the University of Chicago, when he presents about violence, and he's coming, he's doing a presentation soon. He closes the slides. He shows how New York, Detroit, and Chicago in the... 90s and the 2000s had very similar curves of violence and they were losing all three cities, New York, Chicago, and Detroit were losing population. New York fixed its violent problem and its population started to rise. Detroit didn't and they're continuing to bleed population. And he, he finishes his last slide in his presentation. Which way Chicago wants to go? So the beautiful thing about growing up Israeli is you go against all odds and you fight and change reality, even with some losses like 2020 here for us in Chicago. And I hope that all of us, I think you all love Chicago, that we will know and we will fight and we can change and we have the knowledge how to, with the right investments and stamina, to bring Chicago into the lines of a safe city like LA and New York. And the benefits will be that the buildings we see downtown will happen in many other neighborhoods where people will be employed, the innovation, the human capital will flourish and we will be a world-class city. And as someone who is a former Red Sox fan and doesn't like the Yankees, uh, I want the Cubs to beat the Yankees and I want Chicago to be a safer city now than New York and LA. That is sort of my closing I can't be friends with you anymore. I'm sorry. You just dissed my, my baseball team. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We're done. We're done, sir. All right. <laughs> but, but everyone, Chris, did you want to one short last thing? 
so just so that we're, 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 we have a spotless record, we, I have not seen the documentary, Bev, but I will look at it um, and show it to some of our participants. I can't speak for whether other people have seen it, um, but it's worth me looking into. Thank you. Um, and then I just want to appreciate everybody for having us on, listening, staying steadfast, and your commitments. Um, thank you. One second, uh, there's a question that Bev was asking that Tara told me we didn't answer about the movie about the just, song. Tara, the I just answered it. Excuse me, you did? Yes, Chris just <laughs> right. answered that question. <laughs> I must have been reading it. I apologize. <laughs> he was thinking about the Cubs and the Red Sox. <laughs> All of you, thank you so much. Eileen and I are so grateful for your time. The agency is thrilled to be able to work with, with you and, and get these important stories and, and um, issues out to Chicago and hope that um, we'll see everybody come together and take care of each other and remember that we're all human beings and um, you know, it doesn't matter what's on the outside, it matters what's on the inside. So thank you, thank you all so very much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Please remember that this is a first in a series of five films that um, we will be discussing in the coming weeks about, the, about social justice and the Jewish and black communities working together on racism and anti-Semitism. So visit our website, jccchicago.org. We'll have this video posted in the coming weeks in case any of your friends have missed it. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Once again, everyone, thank you for your time. For those of you who are celebrating Yom Kippur, have an easy fast. Wishing you all a safe and healthy Jewish New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you 